What is the timing of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Let me give you an outline of the three points we're going to cover. One, under the kingdom program, the baptism of the Holy Ghost occurred after someone believed the gospel. Two, during the dispensation of grace, the baptism by the Holy Spirit occurs at salvation. Point three, there is no such thing as a second work of grace that gives a believer victory over sin. So let's start with the first point. Under the kingdom program, the baptism of the Holy Ghost occurred after someone believed the gospel. Get with me Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. And what we're going to look at first is we're going to look at some verses where John the Baptist prophesied that the Lord Jesus Christ would baptize people with the Holy Ghost. So Matthew 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Get Mark chapter 1, verse 8. Mark chapter 1 and verse 8. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So John's saying there that he baptized them with water at that moment, but he's talking about a future time where the Lord will baptize with the Holy Ghost. To state the obvious, John the Baptist is speaking uh, during the time of his, his ministry about his baptism with water, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost was prophesied it wasn't going to occur until the future. Get with me Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Luke 3, 16. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh. He's going to follow after me. The latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Get one more, John chapter 1, verse 33. John chapter 1 and verse 33. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So notice this. There are people that when John the Baptist preaches the gospel of the kingdom to them, they hear his preaching and they believe it. Well, when they believe what John the Baptist taught, they would get water baptized at that time. So they would hear the gospel of the kingdom, they would believe it, they would get water baptized. Did they get the Holy Ghost at that time? No, they had to wait for it because it was the Lord Jesus Christ who was going to come after John that was going to send the Holy Ghost, and that sending didn't occur until after his resurrection. Thus, you can see there's a gap between when people believe the gospel of the kingdom and when they receive the Holy Ghost. Look with me at Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Now, Acts 1 is obviously the chapter before Pentecost. Notice what it says. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. In other words, the baptism with the Holy Ghost hasn't happened yet in Acts 1. They're still waiting for it. It tells you there was no one who was baptized with the Holy Ghost during John the Baptist's ministry or the Lord's earthly ministry. Zero, because the Holy Ghost hadn't even been sent yet. Now get Acts 2, verse 38. Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, Acts 2 is where the baptism of the Holy Ghost takes place, including for people who believed years prior. 
So there was people that believed at the beginning of, of John's ministry, and then there were years up until the cross. Then there was the time after the cross, and it's not until Acts 2.38 that the Holy Ghost is given, and people who believe the kingdom gospel receive the gift of the Holy Ghost at that time. Get with me Acts chapter 10, verse 47. Acts chapter 10, verse 47. Now this is when Peter is ministering to Gentiles. Notice what happens, Acts 10, 47. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Now, if you recall what happens in Acts 10, when Peter goes to the Gentiles, the Gentiles first receive the Holy Ghost, and then they're water baptized. The order has changed. Well, why did the order change in Acts 10? Well, the reason why the order changed in Acts 10 with Peter is because of what happened in Acts 9. In Acts 9, when Saul is on the road to Damascus, the Lord Jesus Christ appears to Saul, and Saul gets saved, and Saul is going to become the apostle of the Gentiles. God begins the body of Christ with Saul, subsequently named Paul, on the road to Damascus. And with that dispensational change, God then begins to change some things in the book of Acts. And one of the things he does in Acts 10 is Peter now comes to understand that Gentiles can be saved. And so Acts 10 is a dispensational change that occurs because of what has happened in Acts chapter 9. But notice this, under the kingdom program, the typical order is that the baptism of the Holy Ghost occurred after someone believed the gospel. Look with me at the next point, and point two is this. During the dispensation of grace, the baptism by the Holy Spirit occurs at salvation. So during the dispensation of grace, people are baptized by the Holy Spirit at salvation, not far after salvation, which is what typically happened under the kingdom program because people believed during John's ministry and the Lord's earthly ministry. So look at me at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So how many baptisms are there during the dispensation of grace? There's one, according to Ephesians 4, verse 5. Now notice Romans 6, verse 3. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? That baptism there is not baptism into water, it's baptism into Jesus Christ. In other words, it's a spiritual baptism. Look at verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. During the dispensation of grace, believers are not commanded to be baptized in water, but what happens is there is one baptism, and it is a baptism into the Lord's death. It's a spiritual baptism. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now that's fascinating. So the spiritual baptism that we read about in Romans chapter 6, well, that is the spiritual baptism into one body, the body of Christ. So when does that baptism take place? Well, someone is placed into the body of Christ today the moment they believe the gospel. So someone is baptized by the Spirit instantaneously at salvation because the Spirit baptizes them into the body of Christ. So the spiritual baptism today with the Holy Spirit occurs at the moment of salvation. It doesn't occur later than that. 
Well, get Ephesians 1, verse 13. Someone may say, well, wait a minute. If you look at Ephesians 1, 13, it says that sealing with the Holy Spirit occurs after believing, that there's some sort of time lag. Well, look at Ephesians 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now notice this. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So someone might say, well, here's what's going on. It's you believe, and then after you believe is when you get the Holy Spirit baptism, because it's after. But let's look at the verse very carefully. So start in the first part of verse 13. In whom ye also trusted after, so we see the word after again, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So what that part of the verse is saying is that someone trusts the gospel after hearing it. Well, yes, they trust the gospel after hearing it, but do they trust the gospel six months later or two years later? Do they have to wait some period of time before believing the gospel? And the answer is no. They can believe the gospel immediately upon hearing it. So there's a logical order there. They hear the gospel and then they believe it, but it's not that there's the passage or that there has to be the passage of a bunch of time. It's just the logical order. So then notice this with me then, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's not a huge passage of time. The sealing with the Holy Spirit of promise is the logical consequence of believing. In other words, let me put it this way. Do you get sealed by the Holy Spirit if you don't believe? No. I mean, obviously you don't. In order for you to become part of the body of Christ, to be sealed by the Holy Spirit, to receive that spiritual baptism, what do you have to do? You have to believe the gospel. So you first have to hear the gospel, and then you believe the gospel, and then when you believe the gospel, you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. It's not that it takes a long period of time and there's, you know, passage of time that has to occur. It's just simply the logical order that occurs. Now, you notice how I know that. L look at verse 14. And let's read the last part of verse 13 and then 14 together. It'll be clearer in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Well, if the Holy Spirit is given as an earnest, that means it's given up front. So an earnest is a down payment, it's a deposit, it's a guarantee of what's going to happen in the future. Well, if the Holy Spirit is is given to the believer as an earnest, as a guarantee, as a, as a down payment, as a deposit of what God is going to do in the future. Is he going to wait 10 years from salvation to give you the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, it'd hardly be an, an earnest. It wouldn't be much of, a, of something that's given to you as a guarantee of what's going to be completed. I mean, think about this. If, when you enter a transaction and you make a down payment, do you sign it and then wait three years and put the down payment in at that point in time? That's not the way it works. You, you give the down payment immediately is, is what you do. What God does with the believer is when someone believes the gospel, God seals them with the Holy Spirit at that time as an earnest, as a guarantee of what he is going to subsequently accomplish with them. Look with me at Ephesians 4 verse 30. So Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14 talked about the sealing of the Spirit. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. What happens is, at the moment of salvation, the believer is sealed, and that sealing continues on until what? Until the day of redemption at the rapture. Get 2 Corinthians 1, 21, you'll see the same thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us, notice, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. 
So when you believe the gospel, you're sealed, you're given the Holy Spirit as an earnest, as a guarantee of what God is going to accomplish with you in the future. So what have we seen so far? Well, under the kingdom gospel, the baptism of the Holy Spirit often occurred after salvation because there were a whole bunch of people that were saved before the Holy Ghost even was given in Acts chapter 2. So for by, by definition, for all of them, they had to wait to receive it. But is that how the baptism of the Holy Spirit works during the dispensation of grace? No, it doesn't, because what happens is when you believe the gospel, there is one baptism. It is a spiritual baptism, and it is you are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. It is a sealing of the believer until the day of redemption, meaning that there's not a second work of grace, there's not a subsequent spiritual baptism that occurs years after you're saved. You're baptized by the Holy Spirit the moment you believe the gospel. That leads us to point number three. There is no such thing as a second work of grace that gives a believer victory over sin. Now, here's the idea. What some folks will say is you get saved, and then at some later date, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit. There's a second work of grace. The Spirit does something in your life to give you victory over sin, and that's this second event that happens after salvation. Now, that can't be right because you're baptized by the Holy Ghost at the moment of salvation, but there's some other reasons that it doesn't work that way, and let's talk about that. The first thing we need to do is let's understand some things about sin. Get James chapter 4, verse 17. James chapter 4, 17. Now, what happens, people sometimes when they think of sin, well, they think, well, sin is murder and witchcraft and really, really bad things. And I don't do a lot of those things, so I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Well, look at James 4, 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. See, sin isn't just murder, and sin isn't just, you know, manslaughter and things like that. Sin also is if you know something to be good and you don't do it. Like, for example, you walk by and there's a piece of trash and you don't pick it up and throw it away. Or you know there's some act of kindness that you should do to someone and you don't do it. According to that verse, it's sin. Is there anyone you know? Do you always do every good thing that you know you should? And the answer is you don't. We all have things where... There's good things we know that we should do that we don't, and that counts as sin. Let me give you another example. Get Proverbs 24, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 9. Proverbs 24, 9. The thought of foolishness is sin. So can anyone raise their hand and say, you know, I'm so spiritual at this point, I've progressed, I no longer have any thoughts that are foolish. All of my thoughts are pristine and pure and pleasing to the Lord, and I could write them down in my diary, and I can read it to you, and I can tell you every thought I have, and they're all spiritual and edifying. There's no way that's true. My, my point in going through this is when people talk about a second work of grace that gives them victory over sin, you have to understand what sin is. Sin is not just the horrible things. Sin also includes knowing to do good and not doing it. Sin includes the thought of foolishness. Matthew 12, 36 says, Men shall give account of every idle word that they have spoken. My point is, if you have come to a point in your spiritual life where you think, well, I have victory over sin. Sin is no longer a temptation to me. I don't commit sin because I have reached this, I've attained to this level where I no longer do that. That's not reality. And, and you're not being honest with yourself if you think that's what's going on in your life. And as proof of that, look with me at Romans 7, 17. 
Let's look at Romans chapter 7 and verse 17. Let's read Paul's testimony as to his life. Now, are you going to say that you received some blessing, some spiritual blessing, some spiritual baptism beyond what Paul did? Look at Romans Romans 7, 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul says that sin dwelled in him. He didn't say he had complete victory over it. He said it was within his, his body. It was present in his life. Look at Romans seven eighteen. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. We have that struggle. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now Paul's saying that he struggled. And there were good things that he knew he should do that he didn't. And there were evil things that he knew he shouldn't do that he did. Now, are you going to tell me you've reached a level where you're beyond the Apostle Paul in spirituality? I don't believe it. Verse 20. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Well, if sin dwelled in Paul, you're not better than him. Sin dwells in you too. You don't have a second work of grace that gives you victory over sin. Don't tell me sin's been eradicated from your life and you've conquered it. Paul hadn't. You haven't either. Now, this is not saying sin is a good thing. I'm not making an excuse for it. But what I'm trying to deal with is I'm trying to deal with the following claim. People will say, there was a second work of grace in my life. There was a subsequent baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not the one that happens at salvation. There was some subsequent activity of the Holy Spirit and it gave me victory over sin. I'm now operating at a higher spiritual level, and so on. And that's not what Scripture says. Romans 7.21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Well, evil's present with him because sin dwelled inside him. Verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. See, there was a law of sin that resided in his members that he couldn't get rid of. It was there in his physical flesh, and it's not going to go away until we get new bodies at the rapture. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am. Paul's not saying that he's achieved total spiritual victory there. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul's flesh served sin even as a saved man. And your flesh and my flesh are no better than that. Our flesh is going to serve sin as well. That's why we have to bring it into subjection the best that we can. So what is the timing of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Well, what we know is that when John the Baptist preached the gospel of the kingdom and the 12 apostles taught the gospel of the kingdom, there were all sorts of folks that believed, but they didn't receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost at that time. It wasn't given until Acts chapter 2. At Acts chapter 2, someone under the kingdom program who believed the gospel and was water baptized would receive the Holy Ghost. The way it works during the dispensation of grace is the moment you believe the gospel today, you are spiritually baptized, not water baptized, but spiritually baptized into the body of Christ. And when that happens, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. So when does someone get the baptism of the Holy Spirit today? They get it the moment they believe the gospel. You don't have to wait for it to happen later. It occurs at salvation. So then, is there a second work of grace that gives you victory over sin, where the Holy Spirit confers upon you the ability to resist temptation and you no longer have a problem with sin in this life? That's not what the Apostle Paul said. He said that sin was present with him. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The answer is the Lord Jesus Christ at the redemption of the body, the rapture. So that's how that all fits together. Study these things out, prove all things, search the scriptures, 
Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind.